what would we do today without our Minutemen and women? It's surprising how many with such a healthy church, how many people are sick today. But it, um, it's going around, that's for sure. Nice to have Rob and uh, Margot back from, uh, was it cold back there? Some snow maybe, just a little bit? Wow. So everybody has been inundated with freezing weather and tons of snow, and it's been 60 degrees out here in California. And instead of praising the Lord for our beautiful weather, we're complaining because it's not raining, right? I mean, <laughs> you, you can't ever satisfy people. It's our privilege, though, to worship God today. And uh, the sermon that I want to share with you from Sabbath to Sunday is coming as a result of um, some interesting conversations that I had with a friend of mine. He and I went to school together at PUC at New Bowl College. Uh, unfortunately, he is no longer a Seventh-day Adventist, neither he nor his wife. They were raised in the church. Uh, they went through all of our schools. He graduated from Loma Linda School of Medicine, and she graduated with a degree in uh, marriage and family, but uh, they are not Seventh-day Adventists currently, and that is primarily for two reasons. One is they have rejected the spirit of prophecy, and two, they have rejected the Sabbath. But we still have some very interesting conversations, and I try to keep the, you know, the door open there so that we can carry on, share together, and the conversation that we had about the Sabbath was the one that so intrigued me. We began a brand new year, and in this new year, I anticipated that we would spend at least a few weeks continuing to talk about and preparing for last day events. So we are going to be touching on a number of topics. The one that I had anticipated originally was we would talk about the close of probation today. But instead, we're going to do a short detour, and we're going to talk about this change from Saturday to Sunday. In his library, they have a beautiful home up in the hills above Ukaipa. He has more books and articles on the Sabbath and the change of the Sabbath in those original few centuries than anyone I've ever seen. He's not a uh, theologian per se, not trained as a theologian, although he does have a degree in religion. But um, he is very knowledgeable on the subject. He has truly studied it through way more than, than most Seventh-day Adventists, certainly more than I have. He brought up two major points that I want to share with you I'm going to give some suggestions as to how we can answer those. And then I want to shine the magnifying glass, look through the looking glass, as it were, to the future and see how all of that is going to play out with what we understand last day events will look like, particularly for Seventh-day Adventists. So that's the direction we're going to go today. I'd like to just uh, invite the Holy Spirit to guide us as we study. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, as we explore your word, it's with a keen sense of inability on our own part to decipher the true meaning. But we know that the Spirit has been given as our helper to be able to convict us and to convert us. We understand that to mean that he will change us and that he will help us to understand what it is that we're studying and reading. So I pray this morning as we tackle a very challenging subject that it will be the Holy Spirit who inspires our thoughts and helps us to lock these things in our minds so that we can then share them with others when the time is right. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The arguments that I heard from my friend are quite likely 
what you and I are going to be facing in the very near future in the testing period that's just ahead. And I want to warn you in advance. It's not the sort of thing most of us have prepared to face. The reason for that is because we do not know those first few centuries of history. We have never covered those in all of our classes that we have taken. So unless you've done this on your own, the chances are you will not be prepared to meet some of the things that we're going to have to face. The writings of the early church fathers, I'm listing several of them up here. Um, We know Peter, James, and John, and so forth, but we don't know Ignatius, Clement, Justin, Martyr, Polycarp, and Irenaeus, right? Don't know those people. We may have heard them, but we don't know what they have to say and why it's important for us today. We don't know the decisions that were made by those early church councils because we have never studied them. Nor do we know the astounding theological attacks that Satan unleashed on the church in those first few centuries. We're not aware of those heresies that entered. That's why I'd like to encourage you to take careful notes today. On the back of your bulletin, there is a section here where it says, Sermon Notes from Saturday to Sunday. If you'll just write down anything that you find meaningful to you, that will give you the opportunity to refer back to it. So with this background in mind, let's carefully examine two of the critical questions regarding the Sabbath as raised by my former friend. Here's the first one. You'll see it up here on the screen. If the Sabbath was meant to be kept by the non-Jewish Christians... Why didn't church leaders talk about its importance and provide instruction on how to keep it? I suggest that you write that question down so that you'll have it clearly in your mind. What's that? That was a point I raised, yes. All right, hopefully you've got that down. Do you remember reading about the first church council? It was along about the year A.D. 50. It's found in Acts, the 15th chapter. Would you turn there with me, please? Acts, the 15th chapter. We're going to begin with verses 1 and 2 of Acts 15. Verses 1 and 2. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Saul and Barnabas had no, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So the first major meeting of the early Christian leaders, which was around the year A.D. 50, was precipitated because you had these various Jewish Christian teachers who were going around and they were following Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, and as they went to these various cities and set up churches, they would follow along behind them because they were afraid that Paul was watering down the true gospel, the true message that they needed to be hearing. And as we just read, one of their main concerns was that he wasn't teaching circumcision, right? Circumcision. But that's not all. Look at verse 5, Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, so these are Christian Jews, keep that in mind, saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. 
So along with circumcision, these teachers were were advocating keeping the Mosaic laws. Paul was worried that all of his teachings, through all those years and all those travels, they were going to be compromised and undermined by these men that you remember he called Judaizers. He wanted some clarity. These teachers wanted some clarity. And so they all go to Jerusalem and they meet with the apostles. The apostles there at the Jerusalem Council, after hearing both sides of the argument, remember the story, James stands up. He's the leader of the group, evidently. But he has the approval of the entire council, and he lays out the terms for the Gentiles to become Christians. We read about it there in verses 24 through 29. Acts 15, beginning with verse 24, just a review. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your soul. So this is the message that's to go out now to these Gentile converts. You must say, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such command. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, so they're going to go along with Paul and Barnabas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Notice, it's not just in their thinking anyway. It's not just what they want to say, but it's what the Holy Spirit is telling them to say. To lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from being offered, from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. To my friend, the meaning of these verses is clear. There were only four requirements from the Mosaic law that Gentile converts were expected to continue observing. If you look up here on the screen, you will see what those four are. We're talking about food that was sacrificed ahead of time to idols, dedicated to idols. Don't eat that food. Not that there's anything wrong with the food, but it's the implications involved. They were not to eat food that had the blood still in it. They were not to eat things that had strangled, that had been strangled animals. And they were to avoid sexual immorality. All the other requirements, including the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath, were no longer necessary, he said. But I pointed out Confident in my answer, the Sabbath is part of the moral or Ten Commandment law, right? It was written by God with his own finger. It was engraved on tablets of stone. It was put inside the ark. Right. Not only that, but the ceremonial, the Mosaic law, authored by God, but written by Moses on parchment. Then it was rolled up, placed alongside the ark, not put inside the ark. True, he replied, but the Sabbath was also part of the ceremonial law. It acted as a bridge between the two laws and was central to Jewish temple worship. As such, it lost its significance after the cross. And then he continued, if that were not so, why didn't Paul or other New Testament authors writing after the Jerusalem Council provide any instruction or admonition about Sabbath keeping? They bring up all the other commandments. They talk about those, but they don't talk about the fourth commandment. Did they think it unnecessary to instruct their Gentile converts on the finer points of Sabbath observance? 
Are we to assume that people who came from a pagan worldview for some reason didn't need to be taught about the Sabbath and its proper observance, just as we would do with any new convert today? To be honest, I'd never thought about that. Had you? But when consulting non-Adventist authors on this subject, I understand that this is a point that they consistently raise. If the Sabbath played an important part in the religious life of those early Christians, you would think that it would be front and center in the biblical record after the fifth decade of the first century. But it is not. In fact, the only two times Paul mentions the Sabbath, he's most likely referring to ceremonial Sabbaths and not the seventh day Sabbath. So think about that just a little bit. Put that on the back burner. Now let's go to the second question. I was trying to think on my feet as he presented these. Question number two, if Christ meant for his church to continue observing the Sabbath, why did his followers so quickly abandon it? Now, before we answer that question, we need to look at a second question. When did Sunday worship enter the early church? When did that begin? The short answer really is sooner than most of us might think. In fact, according to historical records that date back now almost 2,000 years, by the middle of the second century, the Christian churches in Rome and Alexandria had replaced Sunday, or Saturday I should say, with Sunday as the day of worship. Look up here on the map. I want you just to see where those two cities are. Some of you have been to Rome, clear up here on the left-hand side. Alexandria was down here in northern Africa, Egypt. Those two areas right there were centers of the Roman authority, of Roman government. So these were places where any Christians who grew up in that environment, in that particular city and surroundings, they're going to have a very strong Roman influence in their thinking. You might ask yourself, well, what type of influence did they have there? There are some compelling reasons for why the churches in Rome and Alexandria had replaced Saturday with Sunday. Ask yourself, what would you have done? That's not a flippant question. I believe, in fact, that it is the very question that you and I will one day have to answer. What was the situation that they were dealing with in those churches? Number one was there was severe persecution of the Jews by the Roman authorities. Why was that the case? Well, just think back in history. What happened in A.D. 70? Correct. So when the Jewish rebellion, and the Jews were always rebellion, right, against Rome, that was just consistent with their pattern. To the Jews, the Roman authority, even going back to the days of Jesus and before, it was an indication really to them that God had sort of abandoned them. And that if they were going to turn that abandonment around, they needed to be Delivered, And that's what the Messiah was supposed to do, right? He was going to deliver them. And so now they would be restored to special favor with God. As long as they were under Roman authority, they didn't have that special favor. So they were continually trying to overthrow the yoke of the Romans. As a result, the Roman authorities came down hard on the Jews. They were constantly arresting them and killing them. Secondly, Jewish restrictions on the Sabbath that had been placed on the Sabbath made the Sabbath hours a very onerous time. It wasn't the type of Sabbath like you and I typically experience. 
it was just full of restrictions. You couldn't do this. You couldn't. It was all about the things that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. They'd also added a new component to the Sabbath. And that was, they said, and this was after Jesus' death, they said that the Sabbath was supposed to be a day of fasting. No eating on the Sabbath. Where did that come from? We don't really know. We just know that based on these uh, ancient um, documents that we've discovered, that was the case. The other thing, and we're going to talk about this as we go a little, a little further on, and that is at the same time that they were worshiping or keeping the Sabbath, they were also worshiping on Sunday. So both of those days were being observed in the typical life of the Christian. Saturday, they kept the Sabbath. Sunday, they worshiped on. And there's a big difference between those two. We'll talk about that a little later. So as a reaction to all of the above, the Christians in these two main Roman centers found it easier to replace the seventh day in favor of the first day. They didn't transfer the sacredness of the Sabbath hours over to Sunday. They just left behind the tradition of Sabbath keeping and they exchanged it for Sunday worship. They were just as likely to go out and work in the fields or engage in recreation as current Christians are today on Sunday. So what are we to make of these arguments considering Paul's advice in Colossians 2, 16 and 17? Would you turn with me now to Colossians 2, 16 and 17? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 2. You may have read this passage. If you have non-Adventist friends, neighbors, they may actually have brought this up to you and said, hey, what about this? In context of what I've just been sharing with you, let's read this passage together, shall we? So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a sab- or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is is of Christ. So he's lumping together Sabbaths with new moons, with food and drink and so forth. He seems to be saying that Gentile Christians are free to worship as they please without being restricted by the old Jewish Sabbatarian laws that have now been done away with. Perplexing questions for Adventists. Now let's look at some possible answers. I'd like for you to highlight the ones in your mind that you think are the clearest explanation for these two arguments that my friend brought up. Number one, Paul was a devout Sabbath keeper, but he downplayed its significance to his predominantly Gentile converts for fear of confusing them with Jewish Sabbatarian practices. Number one. Number two. Perhaps the portions of Paul's letters regarding Sabbath keeping were edited out by anti-Sabbatarian church fathers before the Laodicean Council of 356 met to decide which books and letters belong in the Bible canon. They edited those parts out that had been written. And here's the third. I'm sure there are more than than three, but I, I came up with three at least. Paul taught Sabbath keeping to his converts. He just didn't write about it. But heretical influences, false teachers and so on, and persecution overwhelmed Sabbath keepers into abandoning it. By the way, Acts 20.29 would appear to confirm this particular one. One, two, or three. 
Which of those do you think makes the most sense to you as you've studied the scriptures? Number four. <laughs> oh, I didn't give you a fourth one. It's okay if you have a fourth one, though. You like it, either one of those three? You don't like any one of those? I think it's number three. I think it's number three. I'm not sure why Paul and the other Bible writers didn't mention the Sabbath after the A.D. Council of 50. Doesn't say anything in their letters about, they're not admonishing the converts about how to keep the Sabbath and why it's important and, you know, what's involved in doing so. Wasn't it a conflict? If they were keeping Sunday and Saturday at the same time simultaneously, which they were, you think that their writings could have been deleted about the Sabbath? The sections of their writings? They don't accept the fact that Hebrews was written by Paul. It's a very different style of writing, so you have to be careful about that. Although, for Adventists who believe in Ellen White, we have no problem because she says that he wrote it. So we're not going to resolve all of those issues here today. What I'm doing is helping you to go back to your Bibles now. I want you to really study because this guy made me think. Of course, I've been to the seminary and I've been through classes that we have dealt with this for an entire quarter, entire semester. Very, very challenging questions, though, that we are going to have to face. We know from several early documents that Sabbath keeping continued to flourish well into the 5th century, which was a point that my friend reluctantly admitted. Although Constantine's edict enforcing Sunday worship, along with putting the Pope up, you know, the bishop there in Rome, along about the 5th century, those are major factors in the eventual demise of Sabbath keeping in all but a few places, places in Africa, Ireland, the Walden Seas, and a few other places. But pretty much it was entirely wiped out, as far as the Christian world was concerned, by the 5th century. We've also learned from some of the earliest documents that most Christians practiced Sunday worship right along with Sabbath keeping from the very beginning of the Christian church. As long as... Jewish Christians, though, were in positions of authority. Sunday worship remained subservient to the true Sabbath. But by the end of the first century, as the apostles passed away, and Gentile converts were put in their place, it's at that point that we begin to see that because they weren't schooled in Sabbath keeping, they were more open to a liberal interpretation of the fourth commandment. It is startling to me, and surely for you as well, to think that those early Christians could apostatize so quickly. Inherent in that reality, I believe, is this urgent message for God's remnant. It could happen to us. What will prevent it from happening? What steps can we take to prevent that from happening? I just want now to expose you to the future. There is no other way that you are going to see what the future will hold outside of the prophetic writings. Here is what we can expect 
to happen. Anticipate that it will happen and do something about it. Let's just take a look at a few statements of what we have to look forward to. Here's the first one. This defines Satan's pivotal point of attack. In the warfare to be waged in the last days, there will be united in opposition to God's people all the corrupt powers that have apostatized from allegiance to the law of Jehovah. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will be the great point at issue. For in the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself as the creator of heaven and earth. So here we see plainly that the Ten Commandments, particularly the Fourth Commandment, are at the heart of the rebellion against God and his universal kingdom. Let me ask you this question. Why is the dragon of Revelation so set on eliminating the Sabbath, according to this statement? God's what? His authority, and where does his authority stem from? He's a creator. Exactly. So whoever creates is greater than the objects that he creates, correct? And he is worthy of our worship. Worthy of worship as the creator. To achieve his goal, though, Satan's goal, he introduced this idea of the evolutionary process. He replaced the true picture of God as creator with one in which man emerges over millions of years, right? Through trial and error, through survival of the fittest to his current enlightened state. Furthermore, we have to understand that before probation closes which I believe is a point not far distant, something's going to happen. All Christian will be divided into two classes, two great classes of people. One, those who keep the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, and the other, those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark. Two great classes. So when Sunday laws are being agitated, and we talked about that last time. And the courts of the land are being forced to legislate Sunday worship for every citizen. God is going to call on us to witness for the truth about God's holy law. We read about it. Here it is. This is what we can anticipate. This time, when there is such an effort to make to enforce the observance of Sunday is the very opportunity to present to the world the true Sabbath in contrast to the false. Now notice the next line there. The Lord and his providence is far ahead of us. Haven't you found that to be the case in your life? God is so far ahead of us. He's got it all orchestrated if we would just let him carry it out and not worry about it and not try to get in his way. He has permitted this Sunday question to be passed to the front that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment may be presented before the legislative assemblies. Thus, the leading men of the nation may have their attention called to the testimony of God's word in favor of the true Sabbath. Wow, when this time comes, it will not be a time when Seventh-day Adventists need to be burying their heads in the sand. Wow. It was for these moments that God's people have so long been prepared. That's what we're trying to do with this series, is to prepare you for what we know is to come. We are to be witnesses to the truth as it is in Jesus. We are to be like Martin Luther before the Diet of Worms. It's going to be our privilege to stand before the courts and share our Bible-based convictions it's our privilege to share the beauty of the Sabbath in the clearest possible light. And as the Holy Spirit inspires our minds, our thoughts, our words with power and conviction, we're going to be able to have a dynamic testimony. That's our opportunity. But the question is this, friends. 
is the Sabbath a beautiful experience for you and your family now? If it's just a checklist, you know, I got to go to church today. Because if I don't go to church, if I don't pay my tithe, then God's not going to love me. If that's the experience of the Sabbath, if we are looking at our watch as young people and saying, wow, I wonder when the Sabbath is going to be over because I got some things to watch on TV, I got some places to go, some things to do. If that's our attitude about the Sabbath, man, are we going to stand up when we're being persecuted? No way. We're just going to slide down easy street because it's not worth it to us. If it's not worth it to us now, what makes us think it's going to be worth it to us then, right? It won't be. To stand like Luther, however, will not be possible unless we come to the time of testing fully armed. I want to suggest that that fully arming is a two-part arming. One is a head knowledge. The other is a heart knowledge. We not only need to know the truths of God's word, but we have to have a special personal relationship with Jesus Christ that makes us, that compels us to stand for him though the heavens fall. Would you look with me at 1 Peter? Going back to the end of our Bibles. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. Peter has some important words of advice and counsel to a last day people. He says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. To be able to give a reason for why we believe in the Sabbath and why we practice Sabbath keeping when the entire world says, you guys are the ones who are the cause of all of our problems. If you just get your act together and join us in unity, all the churches coming together, all the country coming together, we could fight this terrible disaster or whatever it is that happens that's going to trigger this. And we're going to have to have our grounds. We're going to have to know from God's word. We're going to have to know what other people are saying ahead of time so that we can counter those arguments. Because all in that evil day would fearlessly serve God according to the dictates of conscience. All who would. We'll need courage, firmness, and what's the next phrase there? A knowledge of God and his word. For those who are true to God will be persecuted. And while it's true that all of Scripture, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, is profitable to read and to learn, to know, Seventh-day Adventists must be specialists in our understanding and appreciation of the Seventh-day Sabbath. As Adventists, we believe that God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church to reclaim the sanctity and relevance of Sabbath-keeping that was lost way back there in the first and second centuries. The blessing of the Sabbath has largely been lost to the Christian church since that time. Almost 2,000 years. It has been preserved to a certain extent, by the Orthodox Jewish faith. And we have learned a lot about how to keep the Sabbath by looking at how the Jews still have a lot of truth about the Sabbath. More importantly, though, we have learned that Sabbath keeping is not so much about the don'ts, but it is about the do's, the values 
the time that we can spend with our Creator God, with our children, with our friends, our church family. It's a time when we can learn to know God better and to trust Him more. God's appointed His last day church to lead out on a revival of primitive godliness that is occasioned, it's caused by, a return to the ancient practice of Sabbath keeping. That's why he gave the pioneers of our church special insights into the relevance of the Sabbath for an end-time generation. If we didn't have the leadership of these folks, we would be just another Protestant denomination. We would be floundering under Satan's deceptions. We would not have a distinct message to give to the world. Now, we have to be careful not to look down on those early Christians because they lost their faith. Instead, we need to be asking this penetrating question. If the Christian church of the second and third centuries, bold in its stand against Rome, persecuted and hunted for its beliefs, ready to be burned, imprisoned, or drowned for its Sunday worshiping faith. If they could be led astray in this cardinal point of faith, how easy might it be for Adventists today to surrender their regard for the Sabbath? As we learn in the sermon on the shaking, it is predicted that whole companies will leave the Adventist faith when persecution comes. Entire churches will be decimated. But never those who have been settled into the truth so strongly that they cannot be moved. Is that where you are today? Are you settled in? Or are you going to be shaken out? Our Sabbath-keeping practices today, our closeness to Jesus today, our willingness to study our Bibles as never before will largely determine our ability to stand boldly for the truth when the day of testing arrives. I love this song. It's on page 383. Don't see a hymnal here, but choruses will bring one up for me. It's entitled, O Day of Rest and Gladness. Is the Sabbath to you a day of gladness? Is it a day you look forward to? As you do, I encourage you to defend the Sabbath at every opportunity as you study and prepare to meet Jesus.